She's April. And she's Molly. And we are the Book Besties. Levi's eyebrows are pornographic. Nick the dick is all I have written. He's an end table. Half liked to worry. It made her feel proactive, even when she was totally helpless. I immediately saw you and me. It turns out they really needed therapy. You should be on drugs. You know what? You haven't eaten. What's going on with you? Why do we write fiction? It's a mother flapping cliffhanger. Hey! You! How are you? Uh, it, I'm here, man. I'm yeah. here. I literally um, got ready maybe an hour ago because I've been in PJs all day. And full disclosure, I am still in PJ pants, but I have on makeup. Oh, bro, same. <laughs> I am same. I have the same pants on. I slept in. I um, it's a non-wash hair day, so I didn't. I got a. I washed the rest of me, but I definitely put the same pants on because PJ bottoms don't count. Like, yeah. Well, no one can see them, and I have been studying my ass off. Um, you have been busting ass. I'm really proud of you. So I am taking three exams to get my teacher certification here in Virginia. Um, I had it, it had lapsed because I hadn't been a teacher for so long. Um, and so, and the last time I taught was like 2010 in, um, 2009, 2010 in Texas. So like, right. and I was just going to say it was here, right? Yeah, it was. Um, and so I have now taken one exam and passed. So yay for that. Ooh. Um, oh, which I knew you would. I was definitely really nervous for it. Right. I have two more exams, and those are this week. So by the time this pod premieres, hopefully I will have passed all my things. And she will a, have, because I am teacher. putting the good juju out there. You Thank are you. a real teacher. You well, are I mean, a real teacher. Right now, I'm just a provisionally licensed teacher. But... Um, <laughs> I'll be like a full You need adult supervision is what you're telling me. <laughs> I mean, that's never not true for me. Like, I always need a more adult adult, but... Um, Bro, same. Right. <laughs> uh, like, do you, I don't know how many times... With, okay, so with my illness, there is a lot of things... I have weight limits. I'm not allowed to pick up. Um, I can't bend. Like, there's a lot of bending I shouldn't right. do just because of the way my spine is. And I am known for screaming in this house i mean an adult <laughs> like I mean, and livia will come running livia will come running and be like what do you need mommy and livia is what 10 now 10. she'll be 11 in september <laughs> oh she's so cute um <sighs> so i mean i don't have that problem but i definitely was getting into bed a couple of days ago where i've set up my like study session uh-huh. and my my kids have like decided to watch YouTube videos beside me. This is their thing. And I was getting into bed and I hit my knee on the corner of my nightstand and literally just started screaming and crying. I was like, I am injured. I have broken it. Someone needs to help me. So Tom comes into the room. He comes in, not quickly. <laughs> like, meandering at Tom's speed, I'm assuming. It's he's a, sh- a real slow mosey from the from like his office, which is like the room next door. A real slow mosey, like, hey, what happened? <laughs> like, yeah, I am right. dying, I am dying. So I, my knees all bruised right now. Which whatever. You all right? You want to talk about it? <laughs> like, do you need, do you need a band aid? <laughs> Fortunately, he didn't use the same, like, cadence we use with the kids, which is, like, you're fine. Like, get over it. Get up, shake it off. I was well, definitely like, crying. Like, I'm dying. My knee is dead. The, the quote I have here is, you're allowed to have your feelings, but go have them in your room. Right. <laughs> but, yeah. um, we, we, we tell Sam a lot, feel your feelings. Maybe just not so much. <laughs> So, um, Matthew Pix pointed out something the other day, and okay. you're just going to be just as surprised. Okay. He goes, you know, I'm really proud of you. And I go, why is that? And he goes, not a single Firefly reference since you guys have started filming. And I go, <gasps> how have we not done that? I have no idea. He goes, I cannot believe you've not referenced Firefly once. Well, that needs to change. And I was like, let's not lie. I reference it. Daily. 
Yeah. I mean, we've gotten I mean, in all the other things that we referenced. Mean Girls has already been in there. Like, we've referenced those things. So, like, um, how much do we reference Twilight, uh, Hunger Games? Like, but, like, I mean, I'm known to just say, everything's fine, Cap, nothing to fret. Like, I, so he's like, I'm like, now, now I feel like I have to. Like, I'm going to, sh- sh- sorry, fans. Welcome to the new world. It's a new world order. I have proved my husband wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously priorities. So. Yes. So but we are we are going to be talking about a book tonight <laughs> or today. Accidentally grabbed in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wait. Wait a minute. What? You did what? <laughs> okay. So I started listening to Okay, so we are doing Fangirl Friends. Let's uh, Fangirl by Rainbow Rowell. So, um, I started listening to the audiobook, and they jump between narrations and the, the, the fan art, the fan stuff, and they reference, like, we're gonna get into all this, they reference, like, text, and they reference websites, and I'm like, I need to see this formatting. Yeah, I wondered how the audiobook was, because I've only read the physical book. The audiobook's fantastic. I'll put the narrator's name in the notes, but... I'm like, I need to see this. So I got on our local library's website. I put a hold on it. I sent it off. Didn't think about anything till I got the email. I go to pick up at the hold book. I scan it out. I get in the car. I open it up. It's in Spanish. And I open the cover. And I look at the cover. And the cover just says fangirl. And then I open it back up again. And I go, it's in Spanish. (laughs) And Matt, who drove me over to the library goes what's the problem and they go i'm not going back inside and they just close the book and he drives me home <laughs> i got to see the full thing <laughs> oh my gosh um <laughs> like and let's not lie there's nothing wrong with the spanish language i took four ish years in high school but that was a long time ago my spanish is not good <laughs> my spanish my, is not good <laughs> my favorite part of this story first of all Number one, you're supporting local libraries, which please do that. Please support local libraries. Always. Always. Um, number two, you couldn't be bothered to go back inside no. and, get, and get the English version. No, I, I felt like an idiot. I didn't want to go inside and be like, hi, I reserved this book. I didn't, th- I didn't look close enough at the description and got the Spanish one on accident. I did not want to be that asshole that was like, you know what? No, I'm going to take my lumps. I did this to myself. You were still there. You, you were still at the library. You could have just, just gone back in. I just needed it for formatting. The format didn't change. Just the language. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry. That was a quite a light laughing fit. And um, I know when I laugh, like I'm not able to be understood at all. Like Tom has made that very clear that I just need to stop laughing before I try to talk. So no, listeners, keep laughing. I'm sorry. I'm hilarious. Sorry. No, but like I just I, I needed the formatting. Right. That's so all I, I wanted. I own the ebook version of okay. this, and I checked out the physical uh, copy. Not it's in Spanish. English, right? It's in English. <laughs> but um, if you are watching online, this is the um exclusive collector's edition and i just want to show like <gasps> oh there's, there's that's fan beautiful art, and this is fan art from her fans of this book um so i just thought that's that, fantastic that. that's gorgeous that is fantastic so and there's also Sorry. a sneak peek of um carry on in here which we'll talk about a little bit later but um don't ignore can- the face ignore the face i'm I'm a little butthurt. So, yeah. Okay. So let's first and foremost go over this is an April. Sorry, 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 sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh yeah, this is an April pick. You're right. This is an April pick, and I've never read this. Yes. And so, like Discovery of Witches, this was the first time that like which was last week. Go listen to it if you haven't listened to it now. Yes, please listen to it. That one Molly picked, and I had never read, and this one. I picked and Molly had never read. Um, so, uh, but I, can I give a summary for everybody? Yes, yes. I was just going to tell them that I texted you and yelled at you. That I was you mad did. that I did. But I mean, I have to tell you, I did warn you, you that did, I... But I thought it was like this tragic ending or... No. 
we'll, I, okay, we'll, come, we'll jump into we'll it. Come back to that. We'll come back to that. Okay, so here's our summary. Um, so um, our main character is Kath. Um, she is a college freshman. She is a twin. Um, her twin sister's name is Ren. Their name is Cather Ren. Like Kath's Kath name Ren. is actually Cather. Cather Ren. Um, they are twins. They are identical twins. The summer before their freshman year of college, they're going to the same college. Um, they Ren tells her, I want my own space. I want us to be our own person. She cuts off her hair and really tries to identify herself separate from Kath and decides that she doesn't want to room with Kath. So Kath goes to her freshman year knowing no one besides her twin sister who doesn't want to be the twins anymore. And she gets matched to room with Reagan. And Reagan comes with a package deal of Levi, who is, um, we think at the time that they're boyfriend and girlfriend, but that's not. I mean, mean, we'll talk more about that. It 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 definitely definitely feels feels like it. Right. But we'll talk more about that. Um, Kath has a, an anxiety disorder. Um, she deals with anxiety quite regularly. My favorite quote from the book is Kath liked to worry and made her feel proactive, even when she was totally helpless. I relate to that on a cellular level. Same. So the other interesting thing about Kath, besides the fact that she's a freshman, she is a writing major, English major. Um, she Woo! writes. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, <I'm> English majors. <laughs> I'm saying the creative writing majors. Woo-woo! Right, right. That's yes. My- And I'm essentially an English major. But anyway, um, Kath writes an online, um, part of the online fandom for uh, Simon Snow, which is sort of like Harry Potter-esque. That was my Um, first note. My first note. So, Harry Potter, laughy face. (laughs) Yeah. So, Simon Snow, and she's a part of the online fandom, and she writes fanfic, or fic, um, about Simon Snow, and it is one of the most popular fanfics in the Simon Snow uh, fandom, and it is called Carry On. Um, She, uh, yeah, so throughout this year, this is her, this book takes place in her freshman year, Um, so there's all sorts of those things that you experience as freshmen. There is uh, alcohol abuse, there is partying there is navigating difficult relationships talking um, about family drama like family drama um and there is there are a lot of references to mental illness in this and mental well, health yes and mental health and getting that help um and uh um let's see uh the re- main relationship in this book in my opinion is not levi and kath it is simon and kath and um, I think this is proven by the way, the fact that this book doesn't get a happy ending for everyone, except it gets a happy ending for their fandom. So, and so that's basically what happens in this book. Okay, so I think the main relationship is Kath with Kath. Well, I mean, there's a lot of that. Kath with Kath. I think we focus on, in this book, one, Kath in general. But we also are focusing on Kath's growth, her growth as a sister, her growth as a friend, her growth as a daughter. And I think that's the big relationship, but we'll get into it. Definitely. When we talk about those different types of conflict, this is very English teacher of me. I'm sorry. Um, It's definitely a person versus self conflict. Um, I think you could make the argument that there's persons versus person because she and Ren are having struggles and she and Levi have struggles and there's all these struggles. I related to that on, like, my, I say this all the time. I love my sister, Jessie. We are better sisters from a distance. And Mm -hmm. I, that is a very similar relationship to Kath and Ren. We love each other. We're great to each other. Mm -hmm. We are more supportive and we get on each other's nerves when we're in each other's bubble. Yeah. Being at a distance gives us space to be better siblings, I think. Um, when Tom retired from the Coast Guard, <clears throat> we could have gone anywhere. We could have gone closer to his family or closer to my family. And we live in Virginia where no family is. You are a family, baby. No, we made that choice. Well, you, <laughs> it was, no, but I'm saying you guys are a family. No, I know that. But we made that choice right. for a reason. <laughs> um, but, okay, so uh, I guess... 
My first question for you is, what did you think? Did you like it? Did you hate it? What did you think? Loved it. I loved it. So my quote for the end of the book. So first and foremost, I, when that audiobook ended, mm-hmm. I pulled my earplugs out and I go, what the fuck? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Literally my words. I go, what the fuck? And Matt go, comes in the room and he goes, what's wrong? And I go, that's it. And he goes, what's mm-hmm. it? And I go, that's it. And he goes, what? I'm like, I'm mad. Mm-hmm. How? I am so mad at this author. I'm still pissed at her mm-hmm. because she made me fall in love with these characters, become attached to these characters, mm-hmm. relate to these characters, mm-hmm. and she ain't giving me shit. She's so, not giving me shit. <laughs> the, the first time I read this book, um, I cried when it ended because I knew it was not a series. It is a standalone book, and it ended with... Like there is a there is an ending. There's not a clear like wrap it up in a bow and everything. It's a mother flapping cliffhanger. You're expecting you are expecting some sort of knowing that it is a standalone. When you start this book, you're expecting some sort of resolution. Yeah. She gives you no resolution. She does but not I tell think, you. But I think that seems right for that that time no. in your life. When you're 18 and you finish your freshman year of college, you don't know what's going to happen the next year. Yeah, I That's don't care about the 18-year-olds. I care about the end of the book. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible that I may have cried because I was pregnant with Sam, but I don't... That's unclear. <laughs> don't bring Sam. Don't bring Samuel into this. <laughs> um. So, I, yes, the fandom of Fangirl, because there is a fandom for this. Which, of course there is. Which was I'm proven by the fan art. There is fanfics about the fanfic. So the fandom behind uh, this book um, has asked for years for her to write a sequel. And instead of writing a sequel for Fangirl, she keeps writing more carry-on books. Yeah, she so, can buzz off. That's what I feel about that. that she can buzz <laughs> off. Keep your carry-on. Very funny, very funny story of this. Um, Rainbow Rowell uh, wrote fanfic. It was never published, um, but she wrote fanfic in between... I'm assuming Harry Potter? It was Harry Potter fanfic. And she wrote it in between um, two of the books that she had written. Um, her first book, which I think... I cannot remember the name of her first, first, first book. I want to say it's Attachments is her first book. And then her second book was um, Eleanor and Park, which I think both of us have read. And I think probably we haven't read Eleanor her. and Park, actually. <gasps> we did it in our book club one month. I thought you would have read it. Oh, my gosh. Well, it we- was when I was going when I was school in school. So we'll probably have to do that one on the pod at some yeah. point. Like, I specifically picked this one because I thought you hadn't read it. But no. I thought you had read Eleanor and Park. But anyway, no, I haven't read Eleanor and Park. Digression. So, so anyway, so she was writing Harry Potter fanfic. Uh, and basically her fanfic was Harry Potter and Draco Malfoy and they're actually like gay lovers but which is essentially what Catherine she right. writes Simon Snow and Baz who's essentially the Draco Malfoy but he's also a vampire it's a whole thing but anyway it's a whole thing she writes the fanfic Kath is writing the fanfic and Rainbow Rowell writes this fanfic in the book so we have mm-hmm. experts of Kath of Kath's fanfic well then Rainbow Rowell decided she was going to actually write the books. So instead of, and there's also in this book, Ed Fangirl, there are excerpts of the actual, the actual the book, book yeah. the actual series. Quoting, of for Snow. those listening to the pod and not watching us on YouTube, we're, we're, we're air quoting. Air quoting because yeah. we find this, yeah. we're being snide. Let's not yeah. lie. <laughs> so she has excerpts of the text that doesn't exist and excerpts, and excerpts of, of- the of fanfic. fanfic that also doesn't exist. And she took that and decided to write a book series called Carry On. And I think there are three books in the series now. And I'm going to put this link in the um, in the description because it's just brilliant. I sent Molly this article and it's basically... It's so good. It's it, I'm so all, good. It, just makes, it still just makes me mad. Rainbow, listen here. Please you and write I, another fangirl. Please write a sequel. I love the book. I am really proud. I I think you have a lot you can share with me mm-hmm. as a writer. Mm-hmm. But if I meet you in the streets, we're going to have words about no sequel. <laughs> we're going to have words. Um, so this article is called How Rainbow Rowell Weaponized Fandom for Good. And Word. It's by, 
It's by Dana Schwartz um, or Dana. I'm not sure. Um, but, I think it's um, Dana. Dana? I don't Dana. know. But I'm going to put a link below because. <laughs> Correct us in the comments. <laughs> because I, I really love this article that basically talks about what she did with this whole business. Mm -hmm. But anyway, you're right. She really needs to write a sequel because this book ends very abruptly. It's one of those books that you're like, I only have 10 pages left. This can't all be wrapped up in 10 pages. What is happening? What was the text I sent you? What was it? I said, I have 10 minutes left. This bitch better end this right. <laughs> and I was like, mm, Molly. She's like, um, you remember I cried. Right. Like, yes. I did <laughs> warn you. I did warn you. Those were your words. I warned you. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So, um, all right. Let's talk about this. This book explores a lot of complex relationships. I a mean, lot. a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, so what was your favorite Which... relationship in this book and why? I'm going to say Reagan. I love Reagan and Reagan with calf. Okay. Yep. I, one, I immediately saw you and me. Aw, that's so cute. <laughs> because, one, I mean, you and I both have anxiety issues like Kath, but let's not lie, I am Reagan. I don't give a fuck, right? <laughs> I do not let people get under my skin. That That is I just... Mean that is just who I am. And I related to Reagan. And making... Reagan making Kath do the things is mm. a definitely Molly thing. Yeah. If you are friends with me, you will know I will force you out. I mean, she, Reagan literally says you should be on drugs. Let's not yeah. say <laughs> I have probably right. said that to you. I have probably said that to you. Like, like, <laughs> let's yeah. not lie. And I, it just, I love their dynamic and Reagan making the rules uh, later yeah. about Levi. And it's just, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I agree. <sighs> they have such a great relationship. I tend to think, um, uh, I, my note says their relationship is such an authentic look at friends who are in different parts of their mm -hmm. lives. And, um, I'm not really like Reagan in that I'm like, really outgoing and gutsy and things like that but I tend to I'm putting at myself friends I'm putting at myself besties <laughs> I tend to have a lot of younger friends um just because like this is not that I like collect younger friends this is it's not a hobby of mine but um I do they're trading but what, cards <laughs> but what happens is I have I have the big sister issue I am the oldest of four and I'm the big sister and same boo boo and, and um, when you are a military spouse and you move so much, there's always those younger spouses who like are looking for someone that knows the ropes. And so I, you know, I've kind of always been the big sister. And I feel like that's Reagan's role in this. Reagan is like, you know what? You haven't eaten. What's going on with you? We're, I'm right. gonna, she you're definitely, being ridiculous. She We're going to the cafeteria. She definitely thought she had an eating, eating disorder. And right. I, I mean, I wrote. Kath is relatable. The whole cafeteria situation. I mm -hmm. carried my books in my backpack for a whole first semester in ninth grade because I my dyslexia was so bad I could not do my locker. Yeah. I went through back pain instead of sitting there and trying in five minutes to get my locker open. Yeah. I would sit there and cry and it was just her anxiety over the cafeteria was just a flashback for me of yeah. that like like yes like don't put I, me in a situation where I feel so uncomfortable my skin is crawling I had to I tried to think about like um my freshman year and what that was like to try to figure out those things like how you do eat in the cafeteria so I lived in a dorm that had a main cafeteria a snack cafeteria that was only open from certain random hours. Okay. A, a actual restaurant. And then that you the, had to pay for it. That wasn't like a part of like your, no, it, you could use your ticket. meal plan for it. You could use your okay. meal plan for it. But, um, but it was like an actual like sit down restaurant mm -hmm. um, where you order at the table and a convenience store that also had like a deli. And that's actually where I worked. Um, was part of your meal plan too? Yeah. All of it. You could go you there. Fancy. And get, 
It wasn't fancy. <laughs> I, I was in the military. I didn't have college. If fancy oh, well. boo boo in the galley. <laughs> but I was trying to remember how I figured out how you ate in all those places. And the thing is that the people snack, watching. <laughs> that's exactly what it was. The snack one that like the snack aisle that was like only open <laughs> random hours. I never quite figured out how to eat there, but they have the best chicken strips and they have the best like onion petals they were like they were like onion rings but instead of like being a ring they were like just like a petal so it was like a blooming onion just like bits but cut up, it. yeah yeah and they had the ranch dressing i still like the it's the dream ranch dressing like i'm from the midwest so you we know our ranch dressings and like i would want to go to the aisle because i would want that, that ranch dressing fried fried food but i wanted the ranch dressing um but i never quite figured it out like it would be at random times but um but yeah, I, I like Regan and Kath's relationship. I, I would say my favorite relationship in the book. Um, I I actually agree with you. Mine is also Regan and Kath. Oh my god, besties, we finally have an agreement. <laughs> Mark um, the dates. Put but, it on your calendars. We'll celebrate it as an anniversary. <laughs> but I will say that's what really bothered me about. Kath's relationship with Levi. So Kath and Levi are Kath, sorry, Reagan and Levi, they're not together anymore. But right. Kath thinks they are. Right. Kath thinks they are. And um I knew uh, this was gonna come up. Cheating by proxy is what I wrote down. Yes. The first time that they kiss and they fall asleep in the bed. They don't do anything else. They kiss and they basically fall asleep. Um, she was helping Levi study, which I'll explain why later but um i have a note uh, about it i know that you want to talk about that so we'll come back to that but she at that point thinks that this is her roommate's boyfriend like that's unacceptable that's against the laws of feminism so like you just don't do that um so (laughs) we're going guys if you listen to episode two we're having flashbacks laws of feminism (laughs) right so reagan is actually like pretty promiscuous she's got like four or five boys on the hook and Kath just thinks that Levi is one of them it turns out that she and Levi actually dated in high school and broke up their freshman year of college right after Reagan cheated on him repeated times and Reagan isn't against their relationship she just doesn't really want to be like she doesn't want to like know the things like don't tell her the things but I still have an issue with Kath dating Levi because I really love the relationship between her and Reagan. Right. Um, But Levi and Kath are pretty freaking cute. They're adorable. Okay. Um, Can we talk about that? Do you want to jump into that now? Okay. Let's do it. So Levi and Kath, they're like slowly getting to know each other. And the only reason Levi and her really start to bond is because Levi needs her. And um, I text you about this. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually cried during the scene. Um, so Levi, he's dyslexic and it's a specific type of dyslexia. And I've never they never heard... They never actually say in the book that he's dyslexic, but it but, is really okay. foreshadowed because they do say he can p- repeatedly says he's not a reader and, and it's very clear that it's dyslexia, but they don't actually say um, the word. So, um, I might tear up a little bit myself here, so... Bear with me, besties. I don't cry. So if April knows this, I am not a crier. I am. Um, my ADHD was all over the place growing up. Mm-hmm. Um, reading was not my thing. I didn't mm-hmm. start reading till uh, fifth grade, and that was only because my cousin, my mom's first cousin, my second cousin, Rhea, Rhea took the time all through fifth grade, and she's the only reason I passed fifth grade, sat down, and waited for me to slowly read. He says he knows the words. He just mm-hmm. can't put them together. Right. And I'm sorry. This is exactly how my dyslexia forms. I will, I can read and sometimes I can fast read and sometimes I can't fast read. Mm-hmm. But sometimes you'll sit down in front of a paper and the words just, they're there. You can say, I like a duck. But sometimes, I like a duck looks like it is not even together. It is just, mm. it's either merging, and your brain just can't process right. what is happening. 
And as mad as I am for Rainbow for for ruining this book at the end for me, I am so grateful for her to highlight not all dyslexia is the words backwards and yes. mixed up. This form of the way of dyslexia and it is mild, but it's different. Yeah. And for my illness mm -hmm. to be highlighted and talked about and normalized right. as a grown up, as somebody, as a child, I grew up in the eighties and the nineties and I went to elementary school in a small town. This stuff wasn't talked about. Right. Kids like me were just called stupid, slow, whatever. Right. Right. Um, to have it recognized mm -hmm. as something real and something that others have mm -hmm. was beautiful for me. And it, it made yeah. me feel seen in a way kids with ADHD and kids. I, I mean, I know I fit in the special needs spectrum when it comes to that kids mm -hmm. of a special needs spectrum don't always get seen in a, that light. And especially right. in the era we grew up in. Right. There is a lot of people in our age group who were just pushed through the system so right. they weren't a problem. And this makes us feel seen. Right. And the thing about Levi is um, it's very obvious. Thank you for sharing your heart, by the way. It's Thank very you. Obvious. <laughs> it's very obvious. I, that you can see me crying on the video. You're not going to be able to see it in here in the audio. But... Um, it's very Let me get my together, I swear, guys. <laughs> it's very obvious that Levi is very smart. Like, he's really, really smart and very good at his program, um, his college Same. program. Same. I am very smart. I'm yeah. just not good at my program. I I'm just can't put the words together. Right. So he actually benefits from audiobooks, and Same. Um, that's how he and Kath sort of get together, um, because Kath... What he normally does is he basically collects girls who he can use to help him get through his classes. And Kath isn't in his class, but um, he has to read The Outsiders. And Reagan is in that class with him and has promised to help him study for it, but um, has kind of blown him off. And so Kath stays up all night one night and reads him The Outsiders from beginning Which to end. Which was so beautiful and beautiful. so sweet. And so it, it is... A true act of kindness. A right. true act of kindness. If and it's the start of their relationship because they kiss at the end of that. But and they fall um, asleep together. And I find I find sleeping with a person, even if there's nothing sexual, very intimate. It's very intimate, yeah. But I did have an issue with that first night because after they fall asleep together and after they kiss and all that, it sort of like comes to light that he's liked her all along and she has liked him and to me, that scene didn't read that way. Like, I felt it read like this was just a drunken college mistake, even though they weren't drunk. They were like, drunk. They were just Sleep drunk is a drunk still. Right. But also, okay, friends, Tom, I need a graphic. Abel Gripe number one. <laughs> we need, like, a ding. <laughs> Ping! We'll have Tom look into that. Okay, Tom, I need a sound every time there's an Abel Gripe. Right. There'll be, like, a scorecard down here or something. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, to me, that didn't feel like they had actually liked each other all year. Maybe. Well, okay. I think, okay, so I'm going to backtrack a bit because mm -hmm. I think Kath doesn't understand what really romantic relationships are. But I think she likes Nick. Like, right. I get the feeling she likes well, Nick because she when, still thinks Levi is Reagan's boyfriend. Right. Well, okay, so what's the boyfriend from high school? What's his name? It's spacing me. The high school boyfriend, the, the one that breaks up with her. I Anyways. wanted to say Alejandro, but that's Ren's boyfriend. Hang on, I'll look it up. Keep going. So, her sister describes him. He's an end table. Let's okay. not lie. She obviously, in, like, their relationship... Abel. 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 Oh, excuse me. Their relationship is via text. Their relationship is very it's not, loose. It's and not there's an nothing intimate relationship. There, and and there's not, nothing romantic about it. No, it, it it's it's a relationship of convenience. And mm -hmm. I think that is what Kath is basing off 
her air quote romantic romantic romantic, romantic. is a new word romantic relationship romantic <laughs> her romantic relationship right but she and also doesn't she also doesn't have a very good example of what a romantic relationship adult relationship looks like right. in her own life because yes. her parents have a disastrous relationship where her mom abandons Man, Red damn and Cap. Combo for like pulling in all the trauma. Nine eleven, broken families, yes. like so freaking, when when yeah. Kath and Ren are eight, their mom abandons them, and it's like a few days after nine eleven. Um, it, like the fight starts on nine eleven, right. and, and they're like in elementary school, what third grade or something. Yeah, their teacher refers them to therapy because she thinks they're having difficulty getting over the tragedy of that was nine eleven. And, and she little does she knows, but it's little. actually the home trauma. Yeah. Um. But uh, it turns out they really needed therapy because you know Kath has an anxiety disorder. Ren, we learn, has a substance abuse issue in college. She's not just drinking like a freshman she drink. Has, no, because she has trauma because her mom left her. I mean, this is another really great quote. Her from dad this is mentally ill and they've always been the grown ups. And like, right. it's just. Their dad is bipolar. Um, and I love this quote after their mom left. It's Ren acted out while Kath acted in, which ends up being their personalities, like even into their college and years. I, and it, it really shows their relationships and their status as siblings, as, yeah. as twins, right? Right, right. So. They love each other and they are very close because they're twins, but they also, they react to things differently. Um, right. Kath, Kath tends to be the one that like wants to take care of everything, um, even if that just means that she sits around and is anxious about it, which right. is like, what's, so what's, Which is wild is because... Kath will overthink the situation and want to take care of it, but Ren is a person of action. Mm-hmm. Ren sees the situation. If she's going to get involved, she sees the situation and she jumps in and fixes it, right? But but I think sometimes Ren jumps in and tries to do things that aren't helpful. Like, right. she, she's reckless. She's reckless with her life. She um, drinks to excess regularly that ends up, she gets alcohol poisoning. Um and uh, someone just drops her off at the hospital. We don't even ever find out who that person was. I think it was probably her roommate, Courtney, just based on the fact that they stopped. Okay, so I have a note about this. I have a note about this. Courtney is definitely to blame in all caps ER visit. Like, I, 100% Courtney is our problem child here. I, I mean, I don't know what happened that night. We, ne- we never find out. Ren says well, I'm she doesn't remember. Courtney. I'm just I assuming Courtney's. Courtney. I, I'm assuming yeah. it's Courtney. Right. I also have a note that says, um, I just saw it. Is Ren being selfish or a normal teen? And when I wrote this, I was more referring to the way she's treating her sister. Yeah. Like, is she being normal or do you think it's selfish i mean i can understand her this is for chapter 19 like when she texts kath 911 and kath runs over there yeah and the only thing she has to say is wrong c which is just right dick move friend dick move i mean she was drunk so there's that but i think that um i i think there's like validation and wanting to be your own person and like I imagine, I mean, I'm not a twin, but I imagine that in that relationship of a twin... Boo, we're twins. <laughs> you never get to be separate. You're just a package deal. And, like, I feel like two of my brothers, they're 17 months apart, so they were one grade apart, and um, they were always a package deal. You were getting JR, you were getting Max. It was always a package deal. And I think that they wanted that separation, you know, that's my girls right identity. now. You know, yeah. as a parent, that's my girls right now, and I constantly worry about this, mm-hmm. and I constantly am pushing them into their own things. Like, mm-hmm. if Piper's doing something, and I go, "Liv, you're not into this. Why do you want to yeah. do it? Why do you, you want to do it? Right. right? Yeah, we're so, having the same problem with right. James and Sam because um, the girls are." The official Irish twins, right? They're, mm-hmm. Piper was less than nine months pregnant when we found out. Like, I found it in February. I was pregnant with Olivia, and Piper was due in March. So, I, and Piper was, first birthday was in March. So, like, they're less than 13, like, they're 14-ish months, 18, like, 14 to 18 months apart. Like, it, it's just, yeah, it, it, it's a thing. It's a thing for sure. Right. Um... 
Can we transition to another question I have for you? Please. Okay, so uh, do you? So you're a part of different fandoms. I mean, I am too. Um, but uh, I do you think this book is an authentic look at fandom? And what similarities do you see between cast fandom of Simon Snow and the Harry Potter fandom? Because you're a part of that fandom. Now I'm not, but I know you are. So okay, so um, I actually been mulling this over during like the um, after reading this. I my strongest fandom is Firefly, right? Like I will, Yay. I will. I mention this show daily. I make everyone, like, I tell you, if you're going to be my friend, you need to watch this, because if not, you're not going to get my references. Mm-hmm. I, the, you can't stop the signal, Mal. You can't stop the signal, right? Yeah. This is a good viewpoint on how fandoms work. Okay. If, if, the hair, there is, on Reddit, there is thousands upon thousands upon thousands Harry mm-hmm. Potter fanfics. There's Harry and Hermione. There's Hermione and Draco. There's Draco and and Harry. There is a vast just there is a sea that ne- like there are so many head cannons you just you can get lost. Mm-hmm. And there are so many kids like Half out there who bury themselves in their fandoms. Yeah. And as one of those kids, like I used it when I was in the military, I used Firefly as a reason to stay in my quarters. So I didn't have to socialize and meet new people. It was my safe haven. It was warm. It was comfortable. I I, I did my work. I ate in the galley. I went back to my bunk. I, you know, and it made well, life easier. Well, and I think um, it's a good it's a good binky. It's a good blanket. It's a good security blanket. And I think um, so. Rainbow Rowell is a few years older than me, um, and I think that the younger millennials, um, not not us older ones that are barely millennials, but the younger ones well, especially, they call us elderly millennials. The elder millennials. Whatever. Geriatric millennials. That's the term. What, <laughs> the younger ones, the ones that actually grew up with Harry Potter, that Harry Potter was like, they were kids when Harry Potter was. Harry okay. Potter was kids. But oh, I, I, so, think, I think we're going them, to. Sorry. Can I sorry. just one thing? Yeah. Today is 713. Today is Harry Potter's 41st birthday. 31st. Uh, July 31st. 31st. Yeah, 31st. The 31st. Sorry. It is 713. See, dyslexia. 731. Today is Harry Potter's 41st birthday. So Harry so Potter Harry, is my age? Yep. Today's his 41st, 41st birthday, I believe. But when the books came out... He I was, was right. But they were post-dated. But okay. JK right, post... Sense. Yeah, okay. Sorry, anyways, I didn't mean to interrupt. So I just wanted to reference. Say, yeah. is the kids that grew up with Harry Potter, that it was like... Mm-hmm coming out as they were kids, the internet was also a thing. And so I can see how fandoms really changed because you don't have to go to Comic-Con anymore to be a part of a fandom. You can be a part of it in an online community, which by the way is brilliant because we're all geeks and we prefer. And, and we, not so we also have, person. we also have a nerd mom group. Mm-hmm. Where yes. I love our group. I love our nerd mom group. And we share not just Harry Potter. We share Harry Potter. We share Star Wars. We share Marvel. We share Firefly. We share all the things. But we also talk about being moms. And we, but mm-hmm. it is a way to have internet friends yeah. with and have friends without. Right. Sorry, I hit my mic. It's without like leaving the comfort of our home right. and finding people that right. get who we are. Right. In this like little box okay but that brings us to our next question because this becomes an issue in the book Word. is is fanfic real art is it real writing or is it plagiarism because calf tries to turn it in for a college, college paper i and agree that with go over well. okay so i agree with the professor i do too um 
I've done fanfic. It's it it was like my early stages of writing. It's how I kind of like got into writing and dabbled and used my creative juices when I didn't know how to write. Mm-hmm. But I never shared it with the world. It, sitting on an old laptop somewhere in the attic, but I would never try and take somebody else's world and make it my own. Right. Well, I mean, she's in a fiction class, so it needs to be her original work. It really does. Agreed. And, Agreed. And I agree with her professor. Her professor's name is Professor Piper, and um, she won't accept it. <laughs> right. right. She my Piper. It. Yeah. She, she won't accept <laughs> it because she, Calf didn't create this world. Right. And what I, what I like about how she handles that situation with her is that she doesn't tell her, um, like, uh, you can't write this well. She tells her, not everybody can write this. You don't have to write this. You don't have to be Gemma, whatever the heck her name is, right. which is the author oh, of the Simon Snow yeah. series. But she also really tells her, you write really well. Right. You are you very good write, at this. Right. You Go write on. you and you will be fine. Right. right. And as a writer, Cass Spiral is a real mother fracking thing. Let me tell you what. Right. Feeling unworthy, feeling like you have nothing inside you, feeling like you don't know who you are is right. a real thing. I don't know how many right. times I've cried to my husband, I'm dry. There's nothing in me. I am done. Like, mm-hmm. not knowing who you are as a writer, I think, is a requirement. <laughs> right. I would say I agree with you. I do think there's value in fanfic um there's value in fan art in general Agreed. fanfic falls under that i but am not a writer for homework but don't turn it in for your homework don't no. turn it in for your damn homework now i'm not a writer of fanfic i don't make fan art but what i do is i read i come up with a story in my head like i don't actually write it down but like after i finished the selection series i wanted to think about what the the married life for Maxon and America would be like oh, for what real? would their life be like what would what would that be like because that's the future that they're building towards and then of course Kira Cass wrote a, a spinoff series which is them as adults with their kids right. so we kind of got to see that but um I I like to keep the story going um and so I can appreciate the fanfic but here's my issue with the Harry Potter fandom and I'm gonna say this again when we do Harry Potter on here. Y'all make up stories and say that it is canon because you don't want to agree with J.K. Rowling. And to me... J.K. Rowling is a bigot. Okay, but she wrote the series. Like, you can't just decide. Like, I know I worked with somebody who was like, I'm Slytherin, and this is the way Slytherins really are. And I'm like, but they're not because that's not how they were written. You don't get to decide that. But anyway... Um, but I think there's value in it. I think there's value in becoming a part of a fandom and really loving something so hard that you want to, you know, expand it. Uh, we, okay, I will, I'm going to just say I speak for most of the fandom. We have separated JK from the from Harry Potter. I don't understand that. <laughs> okay. Imagine you wrote a series as wildly popular as Harry Potter, and then you tweeted something and everybody was like, we don't like Molly Biggs anymore. <laughs> Screw that girl. Okay, We're going to take it over. Let's let lies, as long, the longer this goes, people are going to tweet they don't like Molly Biggs. But <laughs> gripe number two, ping. Um, <laughs> here's the thing. J.K. wrote, and this is, this is the defense of the Harry Potter world. J.K. wrote this world where a boy who lived under a fe- under a closet, who was shoved in a closet, which is a metaphor for all LGBTQ plus people, goes to a place where he is accepted. And then she sits there and says, people that are transgender are not real people. And it's like, hey, I believe you people that are gay and all and all the others are good, but you, the trans ones that are in the closet, not real. Like, that's We're going to have to talk more about this when we talk about Harry Potter because I do not think that is a good metaphor for what Harry is doing. That he's he's not gay. Like, I don't get no. that metaphor at all. We're going to have to come back to this, Molly. We're going to run out of time and we're still talking about fangirl. So quit it. <laughs> Gripe number three. <laughs> um, so, um, okay. while we're we- still talking... Sorry. 
Can we talk well, about Nick? Um, I wanted to stay in writing class for a sec, if that's okay. okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so I have chapter three and seven written down about there. So chapter three, she it, we're sitting down in class in the first class of writing, and P- Professor Piper goes, "Why do we write fiction?" And let me t- was that good? Was that, that good? Is- that is every English te- professor ever. That's all of them. That's right. all of them. <laughs> and there's a lot of answers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Kath, I feel like, hits a nail on the head, right? And I wanna, I'm want i going to speak for myself. I'm not going to fe- speak for other writers. I write one. I feel like I'm more seen. My personality. I feel like the whole of who I am is finished when those words are on the page, right? Mm -hmm. I don't feel like a complete person unless I am putting those words on the page. That is a part of who I am. It is a part of what I do. It is, Mm -hmm. but I think Kath's description in the book is spectacular. And I didn't write it down because I'm a jerk face, but (laughs) I think she uh, says to escape. Yes. That's it. And as a kid of trauma, let's not lie, we're going to talk about this a lot for the rest of our li- for the rest of this pod. As a kid of trauma, the reason we go into these fantasy worlds, the reason we read, the reason we write is to escape the life we currently or the, the the feelings, the yeah. whatever we are feeling at that moment. To get ourselves out of what we're doing and into another universe and into another place that we are not us. We are somebody else. And that's also why we read. Right. It, it, it makes you feel out of yourself for a minute, right? It, it, mm-hmm. it, it, it detaches you from whatever is holding you down, making you exhausted, hurting your heart, right? Right. So... There's that. Um, and then in chapter seven, Professor Piker wants to talk about the untrusty ta- narrator. And I really feel like Rainbow at that in that chapter was being foreshadowing, mm-hmm. right? Because yeah. we can't trust Kath is not really our narrator, but we're seeing her point of view. We can't trust yeah. Kath. Her anxiety no, gets the best of her, right? right. So... Um, um, that the book is from third person limited point of view. So it's third person, but it's through Kath's filter and she isn't reliable. No, she's not. She can't trust herself to do anything really. Right. We're lucky she's at college, right? Like, yeah, that's a good transition to talk about Nick. Nick the dick is all I have written all over my page. Yeah. I, I have a Nick writing partner and asshole. Um, so Nick meets Kath in class, in the, mm-hmm. in the writing class. He's a few years older because this is actually a junior level class that she's taking. Um, Which is and, super impressive that she got into. Right. Definitely. Um, they get paired up together to work on an essay and then they continue to work on essays. So um, he uses Kath to basically get ahead in his own writing. Word. And, and we hate him for that. But I have an interesting question for you. How I think he. The, sorry, sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. I think he recognized her talent before she did. Well, well yes, he definitely. One hundred percent. But how is this different than how Levi uses girls to help him study? Why do we re- root for Levi and not for Nick? Levi's not cheating, isn't he? Levi is. Levi has a illness. Levi has a disability. disability. Mm -hmm. He is studying. He's not looking at somebody else's paper. He's not taking somebody else's work. Nick literally turns in the MFing work they did together and claims it is his own. That asshole, that dickhead says... This is my work. And then Professor Piper, freak, like, she, as soon as she reads it, she knows it is freaking Kath. He, she sees Kath's signature all over that shit. 
because because Kath had a very authentic voice and Nick had a different way of writing. And you put those two together, you're obviously going to be able to tell the difference. Right. Nick the dick, period, bottom line. And when he shows up at the end of the book in 35, I was so mad. Like, I, was waiting, I was waiting for Reagan, not Levi, but for Reagan to throw down with him. Because I could see her being like, come on. <laughs> yes, like, I was so mad. The audacity of that man. The mm-hmm. balls on that man to just be like, you know, it's fine. It's cool. It's not a big deal. You know it's my work. It's when actually we really own- good for you if you put your name on this. Like, this is a good thing for you. Even put your name first. Like, mm-hmm. do you, man, get the hell out of here. Yeah, he's definitely a jerk for sure. All right, I have one last question for you, and then okay. we are running long today, so I, I definitely want to get to what you want to talk about if we okay. have anything else, but this book is classified as YA, so young adult, teen literature. Okay. Even though Kath and Ren are freshmen in college and Levi and Reagan are juniors, what makes this book YA? Kath. 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 One, she is, because of her experience Mm -hmm. with her father's bipolar, her codependency with her sister, with her anxiety, Kath. She may be 18, Mm -hmm. but her heart, she is not mature enough for high school. She's not mature enough for college. She's Mm -hmm. six. Her maturity level is 16, 15. Mm -hmm. She is young. Mm -hmm. She is a very young 18. And that is very relatable. And that makes her YA. And let's not lie. We don't have the mature. I mean, there are some kids that are very mature who read YA but our YA kids are the ones like Kath looking at books and trying to find people that are like them Mm -hmm. they're trying to escape in another person's world and as soon as they pick up fangirl they're gonna find somebody that's just like them yeah so I have a totally different take on this um I because interestingly, we've talked about Red, White, and Royal Blue. We did that a few weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and that book, the characters are very similar in age to the characters in this book. And and it's not YA. I think the content being that it's very uh, sexual. Oh. Oh, Red, White, and Royal is very sexual. Very sexual. And this book isn't as sexual. But I actually no. think that the – I have a feeling – like this is April brain all over the place. Like I picture her publisher being like, well, you had a lot of success with, with uh, Eleanor and park and less success with your book attachments, which was geared towards adults and went published as adults. Let's go ahead and cap capitalize on that fan following you have from Eleanor and park. And let's make this book YA. Gotcha. That's what I think happened. So you think it's um, calculated. I really think it was calculated. She has two books that are adult fiction and then these, the uh, Eleanor and Park and Fangirl and then the Simon series that are YA. And I really think, I really think that it was a decision that was made of they're right there at that line. Let's go ahead and bring the Eleanor and Park people over. Cause she had much more success with that book than she did with her first book. Which Um, makes sense, but also it kind of makes it feel less authentic. But it also makes me feel happy that freshmen can be YA because the book that I've been writing that I probably will never finish is a, uh, is a college freshman. And I don't anticipate that being adult. I anticipate that being YA. Um, and and to me, that's like, oh, good. <laughs> Maybe I still have a chance to be a you YA You do. <laughs> I, I, I think, but we can't write with the thoughts of publishing. We have to write at the thoughts of finishing. You can choose to write without the thoughts of publishing. I don't work on this book very often. So, <laughs> um, so um, there's what two did things. You that, talk about? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. First and foremost, um, so I have a note that says Gravioli. <laughs> nice. I feel like we are missing an inside joke. I feel like somewhere in Rainbow's life. There is a whole side joke about canned ravioli, and only people that know Rainbow in her life know this joke. And I really feel it, like... And it very well could be a, a thing uh, of, from Omaha, because that's where she's from, and that's where the book I place. truly feel like 
we're missing a, I really, that felt, the, the, how intimate the joke is between when Ren and Kath are talking about, when Kath is talking about it with her father, it mm-hmm. truly feels like it's an inside joke with them. Mm-hmm. And it feels like she is writing this from such an authentic place. There is no way this has not been a joke in her whole life. Maybe it has to be. Yeah. It has to be. Like, and it, and, and it makes me feel like I know her, right? Mm-hmm. As a right, as a human, not as a writer, but as a human. Like, mm-hmm. you, sh- Rainbow's showing us who she is as, like, I'm making a ball. I'm sorry, people watching me on YouTube. I keep doing this. Um, I feel like I know her, right? Yeah. Because I write inside jokes all the time into my books. I have one that I'm trying so hard to write in. And friends, besties, when you hear Carl with a C, I ask me in the one day you're going to hear the story about Carl with a C. And it, it's going to be an inside joke written into one of my books one day. Because it's just, it is something that I think all writers do. Yeah. I, I also think, um, I think that, I think that Rainbow Rowell poured herself into Kath. Oh, for that, sure. I think that, I mean, I don't know Rainbow Rowell that, I don't know her personally. I've read a few interviews with her. I've seen a few interviews with her. I follow her on social media, but I, I think that what she did was she wrote something that's semi autograph autobiographical. autobiographical I could be way off I could be way off it just, but I, I, it think feels it. She, I think she poured herself into Kath so um and what a new concept others- what a new concept a writer that has an anxiety disorder like that's never I mean like we all do <laughs> so- shocker shocker um so one of the last things I want to talk about is um when Levi first takes Kath to his room and they're having this intimate moment Mm-hmm. listening to it, reading it, whatever you want to call it, it feels intrusive. I feel like mm-hmm. we're in there, like we're watching this per- highly personal, super intimate moment, and we should not be there. Especially right. since we're in third person, it it, it feels like we're peeping toms. We right? are really spying on them. Yeah. And, and, and I wanted that chapter in that moment to be over so bad. I loved it for them. But I was uncomfortable because I mm. felt like I was seeing something I shouldn't be, right? Like, right. this was a hyper-personal moment. Right. And it was not mine to be a part of. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And along those lines, this is going to be a little spoilery, but I, I don't think it really Don't give is. a shit. <laughs> <laughs> Molly doesn't care anymore. You just have to read the books or whatever. Get um, over it. We told um, you we were going to talk about it. <laughs> I, I I am on the fence about this because I, in, on one hand, don't think it's totally believable. And then the other hand, I really appreciate this. Levi and Kath never have sex in this book. They talk about it. Kath talks about wanting it. She talks about different parts of him. Um, I She talks about, like, what is it? Uh, something to do with his eyebrows. Like, she mm-hmm. wants, I don't know. It was so, something ridiculous. But they never actually have sex. And part of me is like, is that really believable? Oh, Levi's eyebrows are pornographic. That was the line. Um, I, is it really believable? We're dealing with a, a college freshman who has had sex before. Right. Um, so he's not entering this relationship without that um i want to believe that he would be understanding and patient with her but i feel like most 21 year old guys would be like nah i ain't waiting around but but i actually Uh, really like i actually really like that they don't have sex because like that was my college experience right? right i wasn't i i dated in college but i wasn't having sex in college i was very much like i'm not doing this like we're not that's not gonna be a part of our relationship and so um i really like that he's patient with her i i'm on the fence if i believe it i want to believe it i don't know that i do but i really like that they don't have sex in this so um i'm gonna disagree with you you disagree okay i love that um we are in third person limited uh-huh. We're only getting snippets of their life when it the narrator feels like it. There is a very high likelihood 
then that was just omitted about their relationship. I don't agree because in third person limited, it's from the filter of one character. Third person omniscient would be all knowing and then they can choose or whatever. But I guess we could go with, do we have an unreliable narrator? Which we do because Rainbow told us in chapter seven, there was an unreliable narrator. But I, I don't believe that they actually had sex. Mm. We, as intimate as they get and as detailed as she gets in the discussion of like how they are kissing and mm-hmm. there's definitely some touching that happens I think in one scene they're both shirtless or at least she's she lifts up her arms right there's that whole thing and like he probably right. took off his shirt. it's we, a super intimate moment that I felt yeah. uncomfortable word yeah but um yeah I don't I don't think they did and I I sort of like that I think we're gonna just Agree to disagree on that for the rest of our that lives. Also, that also keeps it in the YA category. I'm not saying right. there's not sex in YA. There is definitely sex in YA, but that explicit sex is not usually in YA. Mm-hmm. So the last thing I want to cover. Yeah. I think we need to talk about Kath and Ren's dad. I yeah. think his breakdown, I think his mental health journey, I think their feelings and the way they describe how they've always taken care of them Mm -hmm. one i think it's an important conversation in ya because i think there are plenty of kids out there i know i grew up i'm not going to name names i grew up with a friend whose parent was mm, mentally ill and Mm -hmm. would have to deal with similar so it was much more extreme because drugs are always involved when you talk about title county but Having to be the adult, having to call grandma, having to put dad into the hospital. Yeah. That is hard choices for children. And I think what's really great about um, the way dad's mental illness, his name's Arthur, the way his mental illness is displayed here, um, he... It's realistic. It's very realistic. Kath talks about how he held everything together for about... Uh, an entire school year before he right. fell apart the following summer after his wife abandoned them. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I like about it is he's a person living with a mental illness. He's not right. suffering from it. No, he has he's moments, living with it. He he's, has moments where he breaks and he is suffering. And he and has I feel like that's all of us. That's all, all of us. us. Um, but he's living with it. He doesn't give up on his girls. Their mom abandons them. She literally chooses to leave them because right. this isn't the life she wanted. And I have Her several notes to say, that. fuck this bitch, by the way. Right, fuck yeah, that I mean, bitch. Like, I, I, as a mother, I cannot imagine leaving my children. Mm-mm, mm-mm. She literally leaves the hospital before Ren wakes up from alcohol poisoning. Again, fuck that bitch. That is She's super horrible. selfish. But um, their dad Sorry. doesn't leave. He's mentally ill. He, is he has his own his struggles. He he's is living with his illness. But he struggles. is there for his girls. Do I think he really raised them? I mean, no. I mean, he didn't raise them to the way I that, mean, like, but I, I hate to say this because my husband's a good stay-at-home dad. dad. Like, oh, he's a great dad. My husband's a stay-at-home dad, so, like, I don't want to say that men can't raise kids because they 100% can, but they raise kids differently. Right. Um, and, and you don't often see, like, at least in literature, if a dad raises the kids, they don't always come out complete. Like, they're right. always, like, a little, you know, wonky. Right. But um, I, I really I really appreciate the way his mental illness is handled. Kath Agreed. knows that he's gone off his meds again um, because he's running obsessively, but he's doing the <laughs> other work. <laughs> right. But he's doing the other work. He's running, which is good for his mental health. He's eating properly. He's getting sleep. He may not be on the meds, but he's doing the other things. So she kind of lets him be. She's like, right now, right now he's good. And I think that's just a part of loving someone with a mental illness. You just have to know when to get involved and when to be like, okay, right right now they're living with their illness and I can back away. It's when they are, when they are suffering from it that they need help. Especially when they're like, you see it in the chapters when she's like calling him constantly, leaving voicemails at home, on his cell phone, at work, where she eventually calls his boss, like, where's dad? Like, it is just... 
And and he also has a boss who's understanding. He calls his boss fucking Kelly. But fucking Kelly. Kelly, but it, fucking it, Kelly it, takes him everywhere. Fucking takes Kelly everywhere. took Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he every job that Kelly has gone to, he has taken Arthur with him. Because um, he and, loves Arthur. Right. And he understands that Arthur has a mental illness. And when Arthur has a breakdown in this book, he takes Arthur to the hospital. Like that's a good boss who understands like where you Family. are. Right. That is proof that work can also be family. I'm not saying it happens also, all the time, and but it's also it happens. Proof, it's also proof that there are people in this country, in the United States, there are bosses in this country who do value your mental health. And that doesn't happen everywhere. Like, and I have definitely worked at jobs before where they could not give a shit that I have an anxiety disorder. And sometimes I just am so overwhelmed that I need to sit in my office, like, and take I've a breath just, and meet. I've, yeah. I've just done four story times in a row and peopled a lot. And that is too much for an introvert with anxiety. So I need to sit in my office. I actually had to tell the boss once, I need to put in the computer. I need to put it in my schedule. I need a 30 hour, 30 minute, 30 hour, 30 minute break. I need a break. 30 hours would I'm, be great. I'm sitting in my office and decompressing because I can't people after right. that. Oh, no. I, I and, um, it kicks off differently for me. Mm-hmm. Um, the too much peopling for me is more OCD qualities. I, mm-hmm. I, I, I finger tap by account, like, but not having it valued and acknowledged is a massive. Oh, we're getting hyper political again. It's a thing we do. I'm going to say this to the younger viewers and listeners there will be a boss that appreciates you and acknowledges you as a whole person. Mm -hmm. Do not, I repeat, do not accept them treating you like garbage and, and treating your mental health like it's nothing and brushing it off. We're seeing it now in the Olympics. People are really talking shit about Simone. And let me tell you what, and that child's, She's not even a child. She's a woman. She's 24 Simone, now. She's 24 now. I just see her as a child because I remember when she was a little bit doing the things, right? But Simone put was through hell. Let's not lie. That girl has been through hell. Mm-hmm. And she decided to come back. And it got too much. And she mm-hmm. was okay enough to say, this is too much. She mm-hmm. took herself out of an equation and that is okay. Right. And I think mental health is health. And Agreed. we need to recognize 100% that. 100% preach. And um, you don't get mental health days in your work schedule. Like, you don't get that. But if we started recognizing mental health as health, you can take a sick day because you are having an anxiety attack. Right. You can take a sick day that day because you are depressed and, and your brain is telling you, I can't get out of bed today because all the things are bad. You can right. do it. I mean, I, as a grown adult with ADHD, mm-hmm. there are days where I function fine. And then there are days that I cannot do anything because I'm expecting an Amazon package and my package tracking number isn't updating and my brain won't process the fact that right. that is not doing what it's supposed to be doing. So right. the rest of my day is thrown off because that's not doing what it's supposed to do. Right. And being that I'm a stay at home mom, that's okay. I'm mm-hmm. allowed to, but imagine if I had like a grown up real job mm-hmm. and I'm like, I can't focus right. on anything because my brain won't stop thinking about this. Like, right. yeah, I definitely think, um, the way that it is handled in this book, the way that there are so many elements of mental health in this book, um, and I think that Rainbow Rowell handles them very delicately and appropriately. And um, I mean, she writes the hell out of that scene with Arthur, uh, just the description of second hand of how he melted down. I mean, she writes the hell out of it. Like, I, I agreed. It's amazing. So, but hey, uh, and hey, I'm going to here on. We're, we're running way really over long. and that's okay. I'm sorry, everybody. I tried to I tried to rein Molly in. I didn't do a very good job. She needed to rein me in today because this was my book. So whatever. Um, I am going to end with Reagan's words. Yes. You should be on drugs. 
Let's not lie. We all need the meds. Take your meds. Drink your water. Get some sleep, please. Oh, and when we say you should be on drugs, we don't mean go and do, like, cocaine. Heroin. <laughs> no, no, no. No. Stay away from the bath salts, please, friends. I'm talking about seeing a therapist. Get your shit together. And if they give you medication, take the damn medication. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And drink your mother effing water. Hydrate, bitches. I cannot say this enough. <laughs> and Molly's being a mom. <laughs> okay. Well, hey, uh, thank you, everybody, for coming and listening. Coming? You're not. You didn't go anywhere. You're listening to us. Whatever. Maybe, you know what maybe I mean. You come somewhere. Maybe you took us with you. Let's yeah, not thanks, assume nothing. Thanks for taking us on your run. Um <laughs> Uh, thank you for. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, 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 you know, congratulations. You ran that mile. You did your damn thing. I'm not laughing at you. I just think it's funny that people run. Anyway, thank you for liking, subscribing, subscribing, it. following. Um, we have some loyal followers now, so thank you so much. We appreciate your comments. Um, I have some friends who text me every time they're listening, and I'm just Same. loving hearing that. It's Same. been great. Um, so we, next what's week, coming next? Next week, sister's we keeper. Have my sister's keeper, which is a Molly which is choice, book. and then on August thirty first, we yep. jump into banned books month, um, and we'll which be I'm doing five for. banned books. Yes, and I will actually be hosting all five of those. Um, and but, I will be telling you why I love banned books and why you should read them. <laughs> and then after banned books, we're going to do spooky season, which is my yes. thing, which yeah, I'm and, pretty excited and, about. We'll talk about more. And later. not my thing at all. I'm going to be scared shitless I mean, for all of these books. No, I didn't book scary shit. I promise. Okay. Yeah, we're going to get into a we'll tangent see. again. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you all so much. We'll see you next week. Love you. Bye. 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 <laughs> Thank you for joining us on Book Besties. Don't forget to like and subscribe. The views discussed here are those of Molly and April, not those of anyone else. Today's book was Fangirl by Rainbow Rowell. Your book besties are Molly Biggs and April Watkins. Editing by Thomas Watkins. And music is Sleep Sweetly by Prigida. Don't forget to follow Book Besties on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. If you would like to contact the Book Besties, please email us at bookbestiespod at gmail.com.